Okay, it looks like we're live. Uh, thank you for joining us, everyone. Um, I hope everything's working again with the audio. Again, it's always a challenge, but we're learning. So, uh, today's workshop is with uh, Tony Tubbs, who is uh, excellent and invited us to come and join him at his school garden up at Tesoro High School. Um, he's done this presentation here at the nursery before, and every time it just is like, man, we wish we were there. So during these times, uh, the school was closed down and it was a perfect time. Uh, Tony was available and we grabbed our microphones and we went over there with our camera and Tony was able to show us around. So if you guys don't know Tony, he is an excellent educator. He um, has started a school garden that is incredible. I I've never seen anybody put together a school garden that had such a high success rate. He really put a lot of heart and soul into it. And when we get a lot of requests here at the nursery for, uh, for help with starting a school garden, especially a native school garden, Tony is the expert and usually someone that we refer to. Uh, we can help you with plant selection and planting and things like that. But as far as getting together a community of people and students and organizations, Tony is an expert. And so uh, that's what this workshop is going to be today. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm excited to, to uh, present this. Uh, Tony is joining us as well in the comment section. So if you guys do have questions, he is there to answer those for you. This is a pre-recorded video that we went out there a couple days ago, and uh, we're gonna present that to you live today. Um, without further ado, I say let's get this show rolling. All right. Good morning. This is another virtual YouTube workshop for Tree of Life Nursery. This one for Saturday. What will the date be on Saturday? May 23rd, 2020, during the coronavirus lockdown. And I'm here, Mike Evans, with Tony Tubbs, uh, an instructor at Tesoro High School in Las Flores, which is part of the Rancho Mission Viejo and part of the Capistrano Unified School District, Tesoro High School, where Tony has planted with his students, they have made space for a California native plant garden and Tesoro nature trail. So we're gonna spend a little time getting to know Tony and his garden, their garden, and this experience. So Tony Tubbs. Nice to see you this morning. Great to see you, Mike. Thanks for coming down. <laughs> We've been friends for a few years now, and they get their plants at Tree of Life Nursery, and they really know what they're doing. So as if you didn't have a lot to do. When I first met you, you were coaching three sports. You were teaching two or three classes. Give us a little background. What got you into the idea of getting students outdoors, in nature, planting and tending native plants and creating habitat. By the way, before I forget, he's a fantastic photographer and his Instagram posts are among the best you'll find on the entire Instagram. All right, here you go, Tony. Tell us a little about what's happening here. Thank you, Mike, appreciate it. And I appreciate all that Tree of Life Nursery does for us here. They're incredible. From the advice to the expertise to answering our questions and the plants and the whole bit. So thanks again, Tree of Life. Uh, this all started, right now I teach biology uh, at the school here, but I used to teach uh, also natural history of California, something you're real familiar with, and we would come out here all the time and study, uh, you know, California's natural history, all the plants and animals out here, and just at the time, uh, I wanted to come out here and start uh, restoring the area about six years ago, Unfortunately, they took that elective class away. <laughs> but the good news is, it's still, that topic is still in the biology curriculum. Um, with ecology, 
uh, even down to genetics and evolution. So um, there's a huge part of our curriculum tied into uh, the biodiversity and human impact and what we're doing to our planet. Um, so I, I still came out here and uh, um, brought the kids out here and our goal was to come back in this area and restore it uh, back to, you know, the way it used to be. If you can see in the background, there's a beautiful coastal sage scrub habitat. But unfortunately, when we walk up uh, beyond this berm here, you're going to see that uh, there's a lot of right now non-native grasses um, and, you know, weed, so to speak, uh, mustard and things like that. And I thought, what a great opportunity to get the kids out here to uh, restore this area back to the way it used to be and teach them about uh, restoration and conservation and concern for our environment. And then also, you know, take those principles home with them and then also get that message out to the community and, and bring back nature, bring back nature one plant, one garden at a time. All right, so we have Kevin Allison over here on the other side of that camera. There he is. Can we walk and talk? Best not to. We'll move and then talk. But before we move, how many students are we talking about? What kind of what kind of numbers um, in a given semester or over the course of these five or six years that you've done this? Because some of them have never looked back. They got their hands dirty. They're down on hands and knees planting plants, and they stayed with uh, either a career or a passion toward nature and toward native plants and habitat and i think you're doing more than just restoring habitat and i'm listening to a lot of different bird calls back there and there's a hummingbird that's trying to find a mate just now showing off that's what males do best and uh this is about the students and what they think uh from now on about the environment and especially california so how what are the numbers what are what are some crunch crunch us some numbers Every single biology student comes out here several times a year. Yeah? Every one. So we have the regular biology classes, and then we have the honors biology classes. So you're taking one of those two classes, and you come out here, like I said, several times a year. So, and then beyond that, when they get involved with the restoration, my, I open it up to all school, uh, the whole school, which we have almost uh, 2,800 students here. And when we have work days, garden maintenance days, planting days, things like that, I open it up to everybody uh, here. So we have clubs that come out here consistently. We have the Ecology Club. They come out here consistently. Did you, we have, did you create the, the Ecology Club? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, okay. Students run it. Okay, they've, they've taken that and run with it. Um, the NHS, National Honor Society, uh, they play a part. We also have community organizations. Uh, mm -hmm. Scouts are out here all the time helping out. The local schools uh, help out. Uh, Las Flores Middle School has the Pride Stars, a volunteer group. Mm -hmm. They come out here consistently. Uh, Lion's Heart comes out here and helps. And then, you know, community members and parents, they'd like to come out here and help too. So Incredible. we've got the whole community involved uh, making a difference. So we're, we're planning a plant community. We're planning habitat. We're learning about California's natural lands, also how to restore them. And we're creating a community of students of all ages, plus their parents and local residents, all at a school garden featuring native plants. Let's go have a look at the garden up close and talk about the individual and the uh, groupings of plants, also your technique for planting. Um, this uh, success rate here is above any you'll ever see anywhere. Um, this can be done. He does it all time of the year. Obviously the best time being fall through spring, but. Tony and his students plant right into the summer and they really know what they're doing. We'll go into their techniques as well. So let's uh, take a little break here and move our equipment and uh, uh, proceed. Okay, we've only taken a few steps from where we did our introduction, but I want you to see the garden in context. There's a small area here where there are some native plants which have very recently been planted and some more of the same species, buckwheat, California sagebrush, baccarus, black sage, lemonade berry, a few of the, all the usual suspects for uh, uh, coastal sage scrub. And then the school in context here in this lovely valley, which is 
Chiquita Canyon. Goes, the creek flows into the San Juan Creek a few miles downstream, which flows into the sea at Dana Point. So you have this fantastic setting. And then over this way, the older garden with the same suspects that you would want to see, including white sage and California sunflower and woolly blue curls and golden bush, elderberry, salt bush, a few other things, toyon. And this is all planted. Tony, it looks like you started with just a wasteland. What, what's the story with this berm and this funky drain and, and this odd topography in what to me looks like it was a lovely little side canyon to the Chiquita Creek and now is, uh, was a weed lot and is being transformed back into habitat. Well, tell us the story of this ground. Well, you guys saw the beautiful school uh, behind the camera there. And in order to make that, they had to take a whole lot of dirt from that area, bring it back here. So there were bulldozers back here and tractors and all the heavy machinery back here. So this is all backfill. Um, and uh, yeah, in order to help with uh, drainage, you know, in a huge winter, they made this nice concrete <laughs> berm here with yeah, that drain. Yeah. Very uh, much, uh, I would say it looks like an engineer has been here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, as, as a lot of you know, um, you know, you, you stir up the soil and uh, in come the, the weeds and the grasses and a lot of the non-natives. So that's what we were left with. Um, so did somebody come begging you, say, Tony, help us make this, turn this back into habitat, or did you see this and make it happen? Well, I would come out here with my natural history class and we'd walk around and get all the seeds in our socks and whatnot from all the grasses. And, and I thought, you know, we're out here all the time. And this, uh, I, re I got a map of our property line and I saw that we have a lot of space out here. So I decided let's get the kids involved and let's uh, turn this area into back to, you know, the way it used to be, the way it should be and bring back nature. So. That's kind of where it started towards the end of that natural history California class and then leading into biology. So and that was about five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, over here, we, we have a pollinator garden right here uh, nearest to us. We've got kind of two sides of the pollinator garden. I see the uh, a hummingbird uh, visiting the flowers of that penstemon as we speak. This is the, the, doing their job in pollination. And then just beyond that, we have a California Indian garden. Those are 30 different types of plants that California Indians use in some way, shape, or form. Um, it, out in the distance, we have a sensory garden out on the other side. Uh, next to that, we had a, 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 an Eagle Scouts uh, project, which started out as a desert garden, but I can get into it more later, uh, where we had a couple challenges with that and getting that established. And, I realize most people don't have this space, obviously, but um, you might have an area for just one of these little plots, um, like this area right here. You know, most schools have a, a little area like this that they can use. Um, so when we start um, zeroing in on, on one of these gardens, I can uh, share with you kind of what we do and, and how we plant things and how we take care of it. Well, let's look. What, what about these sort of exaggerated sized planting basins and these whole where the hole was and these big watering basins and what, what what's going on here because this is 100% success we can see that or very close to 100% at the same time it looks much different than the way commercial landscapers plant plants so what are you doing here <laughs> well uh, truth be told um, I'm learning on the fly uh -huh. <laughs> and with with a lot of your help in tree of life nursery I watch Mike's uh, videos and a lot of it's a lot of it's trial and error. Mm -hmm. So um, obviously the the basin, if any of you follow, you know how to plant uh, California native plants, you want to give it that nice uh, basin with that perfect, if you can, slope mm -hmm. uh, where you don't get the root rot there. But and and that'll allow you to come in here and water and and fill them up with that water and and help them through you know the first you know four to six months and. Mm -hmm. And then, boom, they're on their own. So the this, plants that are, that are older, that have been in the ground longer, you're not watering at all? No. I let them go. Okay. I let them go. 
And the ones that have been more recently planted, you just water them on an as-needed basis, but it turns out to be about every once a month or so. Or um, new, more frequent when they're new. Correct. And as we approach the summer, mm -hmm. then it'll, um, we'll still give them the water, but uh, as we approach the summer, these will be well on their way, so they'll only need that water once every three or four weeks, once every month or so. Mm -hmm. And the way we water here, you see there's no uh, drip system, there's no pipes, there's no tubes, there's... There's a big old hose coiled up down there yeah. by the pond, which was a scout project. Mm -hmm. And I turn the spigot on, and I stand there next to the plant, and I hand water it. So That's my zen time. That has always been <laughs> the best way to establish new plants in the garden is to uh, hand water. I see a wonderful example of a native milkweed right here next to a... Uh, ornamental or a non-native uh, variety of prickly pear. Did you plant that milkweed or has that come up by itself? That's come up by itself year after year and uh, there's kind of a, there's a treat around the corner when we go into the California Indian Garden of a whole slew of the, the woolly uh, milkweed. Mm -hmm. And I've actually taken the trail, the path, and kind mm -hmm. of diverted it around because it just loves this area just off in the distance. So this, this speaks a little bit to the tenaciousness of nature at, at all. I'm going to imagine that that plant was there. Maybe it came in from seed on all of this um, fill and this spoils that came out of the grading, probably. But it's native in the grasslands of these hills. And it is, has sprouted. And now there's new seedlings off close by. And you have the potential for this plant to continue to spread. So what I'm seeing out this way is native habitat on the hill that has been undisturbed and looks to be intact and actually looks as if it could be prime habitat for both California gnatcatcher and cactus wren, two species of concern in our area. Do we have those species around us? Most definitely. Yep, they're right. out there. I hear them often. <laughs> All right. I hear and see them. You know, the gnat catcher, not as much, a little more secretive, but uh -huh. uh, yeah, I hear them all the time. Okay. So we have those birds plus many, many more. Then there's this little section of um, ruderals and fer feral plants, weeds, uh, rip gut brome, some telegraph weed, obviously the black mustard, and a few other things. Are your plans to also take over that ground that is currently growing weeds? Well, um, yes, we have our boundary. And I would say, I don't know, it might be hard to see from this perspective. Um, well, if we have the chance to get up on the hillside there and look at the lay of the land, I would say we're probably 25%, 30% complete as far as the area mm -hmm. that we want to uh, restore. Mm -hmm. uh, back behind this is Rancho Mission Viejo property, so we stay off of that area. But on our property, I'd say we're a quarter to a third complete of our efforts. And uh, I'll be around here for about another 12 years until <laughs> I retire, so my goal is to get it, it all planted by then. But uh, if not, I'll hand the baton off to to someone else. So it's just amazing. How long has this garden that we're looking at right in the foreground, how long has that been in? Roughly four years. Okay, so four years from one gallon plants, and at first glance, it, it has every aspect, every appearance, the, the mosaic, the assembly, the function of this planted garden looks very much like the native garden, or not garden, the native habitat up on that side hill. Uh, incredible just incredible when this whole thing is taken uh, shape and there's no more weeds and all natives you will have reclaimed about what do you got here about two and a half acres something like that three two and a half acres okay talk to us about these artichoke thistle which is <laughs> nobody's favorite plant right behind us on this hill it's a uh, it, a very tenacious weed in southern california it, it loves clay soils where there are grasses. It displaces uh, native grassland with its um, uh, incredibly invasive habit. And it looks like you've got an artichoke problem here. Talk to us about your artichoke problem. Well, we just don't want to make the problem worse. Okay. <laughs> so 
there's only so many hours in a day, as you all know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and we only have so many, um, so many hours. Uh, there's only one of me, so that's not one of our uh, major areas of emphasis. But we do come out uh, a few times a year, and what we do is we lop off the seed heads. Really? So if you've got you know thousands before, before the seed set. Correct. Yeah. If you got yeah, thousands. Yeah. yeah. If you've got thousands upon thousands of you know, opportunities to seed, we lop those off and we bag them up and et cetera. Um, but we don't want that to, you know, the seeds to mm -hmm. blow into this area mm -hmm. here and make the problem worse. So I, I don't think we have the manpower right. or the um, expertise to rid that hillside, but you can see how, what we're working up against. Well, someday you might, in, in, the, in the interim, you're doing what you can, yeah. which is what all of us should be doing. Do enough before it's too late, was a quote I learned from Richard Felger, a famous botanist in the desert. Do enough before it's too late. So taking off the flowers before they turn to seed heads is enough before it's too late. Um, I think of Mr. Richard J. O'Neill, who has been deceased now for about 11 years. But in his time, he became famous for carrying a hoe in the trunk of his Mercedes or Cadillac, depending on the era, stopping on the side of the road, getting out and hacking artichoke thistle off of his ranch whenever he could. Mr. O'Neill on the Rancho Mission Viejo, to the point where one time he threw out his neck really bad. He had to wear a brace for like a, six months or more. And uh, I still have that hoe. <laughs> <laughs> so Mr. O'Neill would be uh, proud of you and proud of us. We've had 20 to 25, up to 30 students at a time up on that hillside, uh, on another hillside, on the, uh, the other side of the gardens, uh, working uh, hours to, to, to help. Uh, so you must be one inspirational teacher or a taskmaster to get 25 high schoolers to come out on this hot, dry hill and cut flowers off uh, a weedy plant. How do you do it? <laughs> well, um, at this present time, we have service hours, uh, and I call it my human impact uh, project mm -hmm. because human impact, both negative and then conversely positive, mm -hmm. what we can do for our environment is a huge part of science mm -hmm. uh, in our curriculum. Mm -hmm. So they need to come out here and they need to spend the time in the environment. Um, and they need a grade, which is correct. Yeah, yeah okay. sometimes I will CC parents on the email, inviting <laughs> them out, and then their parents will get them up out of bed, okay. out here nice and early. But yeah, they, they come out here uh, and put in their service hours, and some just take away the grade, and some take away much more than that. Yeah. When, when you were coaching, sorry to interrupt, when you were coaching football and basketball and lacrosse, did you ever have a team that sort of all conveniently volunteered? to help you with your project in the garden? Oh, I have. I've had football teams out here digging holes. I had, uh, in fact, the lacrosse team a few years back dug, cleared out and dug that area for the California Indian Garden. I've had uh, the basketball team out here as well. And I've had other teams in choir. Um, last year, unfortunately, you know, with all the uh, <clears throat> craziness going on lately, they weren't able to follow through, but the softball team and the girls lacrosse team have right. volunteered their services. So yeah, we get the athletic department involved. Yes, and, well. when the, and when the coach asks for volunteers, the whole team pretty much volunteers, isn't that right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, There's uh, a little, little Sounds pressure. a little bit like the military there. Okay, so you talked about being able to see the whole garden from a vantage point up there. Can we walk over there? Sure. Okay, what's the best way? We'll follow you. Uh, the best way is probably along the berm here. Okay, the berm. Okay, we're on the move, and it doesn't get much better than this, if you know what I mean. So we're going to walk around the corner here. Tony, is this an area that you planted? Yes, we planted this area as well. Okay, so this looks to be as natural and as uh, spontaneous as any habitat you could ever ask for. And the birds and the bees and the butterflies and every pollinator can find a home right in there. Uh, where, where are we heading? Up to the uh, we're going to head up that way, but this is what, sorry about that, that right there with the mustard and the grasses is what this used to look like. So, okay. Say the word 
Before. Before. <laughs> and after. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We're getting the hang of this. Let's take a little walk. All right, we have this view of a work in progress. And as we all know, every garden is essentially a work in progress. And this one has its own unique, oh, there's some native grasses that made it in throughout all this grading. There's some stipa and nacella in and amongst the weeds. Interesting. You have a new crop of students every year. We're in the middle of a coronavirus lockdown. There's no students in the school. But we have this opportunity to imagine that as this program picks up again someday that you will have a, a, the entire thing planted you're giving yourself 12 years but I know you better than that it's going to take you more like about five six but let's um, explain to us what we have because I see a couple of specialty gardens down there in addition to the habitat garden where we started our video today I see some benches what looks like an amphitheater and just right here close, a little informational gazebo of some sort. So who builds this and, and what's the story behind these individual projects? Well, we have uh, scouts that come in and uh, by now they know, <laughs> word spreads uh, quickly, go see Mr. Tubbs if you have an Eagle Scout project. So uh, scouts have been really gracious. Uh, they contact me and we work through the process and we probably have, I would say, close to 30 between this side and the other side. We have a set of gardens on the other side of school as well. We're gonna head over there in a little bit. But we have up to close to 30 uh, Eagle Scout projects out here. Really? Yeah, and the woodworking on most of these, most of these are made of wood, uh, is just exquisite, you know, built to last a long time. We've got, like you said, this message center here. We've got some picnic tables down there. We've got some bird houses throughout. Uh, we had an attempt at some bat boxes. Uh, we've got owl boxes as well. Um, the list goes on and on. And like uh, Mike said, we've got the amphitheater seating out there with a stage so we can uh, uh, do presentations outside. In fact, a lot of classes will come out here and use this area. Uh, English classes will come out here. The photography department comes out here. Uh, we've got Spanish uh, comes out here and they do a little uh, like a... Uh, campfire setting and they explain you know Spanish terms uh, using that kind of the camp out setting and that theme right there so so this uh, vacant lot wasteland of the spoils from a grading project is turning into a multidisciplinary curriculum place where classes from all disciplines within the school come out to be outdoors and teach and learn. This is awesome because I think this is the future of education. It's the present of education for you and you've provided it with volunteer hours, students, uh, and the success rate based on your planting techniques and the sort of discipline that you're um, instilling in these kids with how plants need care at first. So do you find that some of the students really take to the idea of of nurturing and taking care of this brand new thing because that's that's a passion that's an art you know horticulture and gardening doesn't just come to you you have to sort of see it exemplified and then fall in love with it are you seeing any of that with your students oh yeah we we certainly do and those that have that passion and that love and get that spark and that interest they're out here all the time Really? They are, they're signing up for all the volunteer hours. They'll, they'll go above and beyond. Once their volunteer hours are they're, they're done, they'll ask to come out and then they'll bring friends out too. And uh -huh. some even pursue, you know, take it beyond and, uh -huh. and they want to pursue um, this area in their college studies too. So okay. it's rewarding right. to, to see that. So a lot of construction going on here, a lot of building, building habitat, building community, Mike. and building futures, building a future life for many people who just want to be outdoors. They want to work in a field that has them in nature and contributing, and who knows what they would have done out of high school if they hadn't been uh, involved with, they call you Mr. Tubbs, with Mr. Tubbs. We'd like to see your other garden or whatever you'd like to show us. Shall we walk through this uh, more detail before going over to the California native garden? 
Uh, we can. I want to show, uh, especially for those that don't have, obviously, this expansive area, those that have a little smaller space, I want to show you our most recent planting so you can get an idea of the process. Out in the distance, there's uh, two parts to a, a sage garden that we started. We planted one in November, and then again in January we had a planting, and in February we had a planting. So we had three major plantings this year, all between 75 and 90 plants and they're doing well, so I want to show you that close up if we can. Okay, so we want to see that, and we want to, we want to see whatever you want to show us, but when, he talks, when Tony talks about uh, if you don't have enough space, I know he's talking to other educators, other parents, people that could have some influence and some involvement in a local school. Maybe it's the school where your kids go, or where you work, or where you teach, and uh, Tony is a mentor. He can be your man for advice on how to make it happen through administration or the district or funding, how you can form these clubs, inspire the students, as well as the horticultural techniques of how to dig a hole and plant a plant. So um, I've known over the years and referred many teachers to you. I hope you don't mind. No. Okay. <laughs> because when they come to the nursery and they want to start a native garden, for nature interpretation and curriculum of all kinds at all grade levels, grade school, middle school, high school, I say, well, we can help in some way here at Tree of Life, but we've got a resource for you. So we're going to have some more details about Tony and his fantastic Instagram presence. And if you're an educator and, or an uh, involved parent that wants to get something like this going at your school, because every school needs this, um, we're here for you and we're all here to help. So we'll go down into the garden and see things a little closer up. All right, we've made our way into the center of the garden and we've got another spot that it looks like it's been planted fairly recently. We'll get some details from Tony in just a minute, but I want to comment on the success rate. I want to comment on the hummingbird, the hummingbird <laughs> in the pollinator garden, the sage garden. And um, we also want to talk about how few weeds there are and how simple this is. You know, I will not accept from anybody a claim that growing, planting, or tending native plants in the garden is difficult. It requires good timing with certain tasks to be performed when they need to be performed, but those tasks turn into activities that are fun, and the results you can see right here with the flowering sage and the hummingbird. So what, give us a little background here on how old these plants are and how you've taken care of them, and even during this uh, COVID-19 shutdown, when you haven't had students, how, how have you been doing this? Well, um, before all this uh, craziness uh, started, we did have students out here and, and they made these gardens. So we took an area like this off to the side uh, with the grasses and typically we'll just, we'll just weed whack that down and then we'll get the students out and they'll collect it and, and bag it. Um, and then we get hose out and we use the students again, uh, just pure manual labor. We get the hose out and oh, as in hoe as in um, we get the roots. Okay. We get all the roots out. So all it is is just a blank slate. It's just dirt. We don't amend the soil with anything. You know, it's all... I have what I have as far as resources and time, and, and we just try to do what's most efficient. So we, we clear the entire area, and it's just dirt, and then we have a crew come in and uh, dig the holes. We have a hole digging party. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this, this time last year, May 2019, this spot looked like that. Exactly. This was planted in, uh, I believe we got uh, the plants in November. Okay. So this is reaching its six month point. So we can pretty much just uh, let them go. You can still see the basins, you know, they wear out over time. Uh, the first couple months when, if we don't have a rain event, mm -hmm. you know, we try to plant in the fall and then have just nature uh, do its job. But if we have a few dry weeks, then I'm out here or students sometimes, usually me, um, uh, out here watering. Um, but the basins, they end up, uh, wearing down and by the time by that time comes they don't they don't need water okay uh, so here in, in the center of the uh, garden and behind us is more of the same pollinator and sage 
There's a, is that a thrasher? This is a fantastic thing. Tell us about the wildlife. You must have sightings in person. Have you set up cameras? And a little bit about the, uh, everybody's favorite in May when you go tromping through vegetation that you are not 100% uh, you can see in front of you. We always think a little bit about rattlesnakes because we are in Southern California and this is their prime month and you're at a school. So give us a whole background on wildlife, including birds. Do you have cameras? And what's your uh, spiel on safety regarding rattlesnakes? Well, uh, we have wildlife galore, mm -hmm. especially with this uh, backdrop of coastal sage scrub and now with these, uh, the restoration that we're doing. You know, we have thrashers out here all the time, the cactus wrens. Uh, we've got some uh, wrens in the nest box over there. We've got some western bluebirds in this nest, nest uh, uh -huh. behind us, uh, birdhouse behind us. Um, yeah, so we've got wildlife galore. We've got coyotes and foxes that come through here. Uh, we do have cameras that we set up, trail cameras. And uh, motion, I, motion, motion sensor, motion sensor uh -huh. trail cameras. And we've gotten, through the years, we've gotten basically everything but a mountain lion. Really? So we've got the coyotes, the foxes, the bobcats, Skunk. skunks, both striped <laughs> and spotted. Really? The uh, folks at Star Ranch are a little uh, jealous. Uh, because they don't tend to get spotted skunks there with their uh, trail cameras, but uh, Star they get, Ranch is an they Audubon get, sanctuary for those that are not watching from a local spot. Yeah, so back behind Dove Canyon. An Audubon sanctuary is jealous of a restored weed lot. I love it. <laughs> we've gotten snakes on the camera. We've gotten uh, hawks and owls on the cameras. Uh, but we have cameras, we, we affix them to both this side and the other side, the other garden. Um, uh, speaking of snakes, yeah, we do, mm -hmm. de I definitely remind the, the, the kids from time to time, well, every time we mm -hmm. step foot out here, mm -hmm. uh, warn them, uh, or just to be aware of the rattlesnakes. That's all you have to do is yeah. be aware. Here's be an, aware. Here's a straight up question. Has anybody ever seen one? Yes. 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 Over how many years? I've stepped on one. Uh, you Yeah. Oh, really? I, I've stepped on That's one. That's not a good feeling. No, I have a story, but uh, <laughs> maybe we'll save it for later. Okay. Um, interestingly enough, we had a couple, two years back, we did one of these trails. A scout did it for a project. And some of the younger kids saw two rattlesnakes, and you'll never guess where they were. They were in that big drain that we showed you a while back. <laughs> that goes down about five feet. So we had two healthy adult rattlesnakes down there. They were down there for almost a year. Wow. And they had babies. Wow, they had that was their den. Little yeah. babies. So we could bring the students out here and show them the snakes. The, some of those students had never seen a rattlesnake before. Oh my God. That's why I say, yeah, they've, you know, the latest classes have seen them because they were in that drain. And then a huge rain event uh, came one year, uh, one winter, and they went down the drain and we haven't seen them since. Yeah, but. So it wasn't such a great place to build a den after all. So I just want to say from my own experience outdoors my entire life is that it don't, don't let the idea of rattlesnakes kill the deal on building an outdoor garden. M Mr. Tubbs garden here at Tesoro High School is surrounded by acres and acres, square miles of natural habitat. And even now we're safe and we'll always be safe from snakes as long as we're aware where we're walking and where we're putting our hand. Anybody with an urban setting or a suburban setting and a school setting, it's not even an issue. I'll, so. I'll give you the shorter of the two stories. Yeah, yes. So one year at the, the other side of the school, um, I was backing up showing a class, the natural history class, mm -hmm. the plants. I was talking about the plants, uh -huh. you know where this is going. <laughs> and everybody started looking at my feet. Uh -huh. like, Why are you looking at my feet? And I looked down and right next to my right heel, uh -huh was a rattlesnake. Uh, a good size one? A decent size one, yeah. Uh -huh. So I just stood there. Uh -huh. It ended up slithering away. Sure. So it all ended fine. Right. But right. yeah. You, we can co we uh, what is it called? Coexist. Coexist. <laughs> okay, so that's the safety issue, but beyond that, the the diversity of wildlife that is finding its way into a restored area near a high school is 
memorable. These uh, students will never forget some of this stuff, especially when you have bluebirds in a bluebird box and owls in an owl box. Yeah, there's a bluebird on top of the bluebird box right now as if it were cued for our camera. This is pretty cool. Got turkey vultures, you got red tail Dragon, hawk, dragonfly, dragonfly moving through, there, and uh, all sorts of uh, activity throughout the day and night at the uh, Tesoro Nature Trail, Tesoro High School near Mission Viejo, California. Okay, we're still on the nature trail and we're on our way to the other side of the campus where we'll see the California native plant garden. But we've got this amphitheater which is constructed. We want to know who built it and what it's used for. And like every naturalist leading a group along the trail, I would say, look, coyote. And someone would look around and find the coyote, but I'm not looking at coyote. I'm looking at the scat of a coyote with some fur and some lemonade berry seeds and being omnivores. This good sized coyote had a nice balanced diet. And off to the side, we don't need to show it on camera, are a couple pelts. There's a rabbit having been gutted and mostly et and some other thing with fur. So this looks like a dinner place for nocturnal mammals, including our friend, God's dog, the coyote. So aside from this being that, what else is this amphitheater used for by day when there are classes and who built it? Well, uh, like Mike said, we had scouts that built this amphitheater. We had one scout for his Eagle project built the seating and you can fit approximately 40 students there. So a whole class certainly. And then just uh, last uh, August, we had a, a scout build this stage and we have classes come out here all the time to do presentations uh, we have clubs out here uh, doing uh, meetings um, we have classes come out and do class pictures sometimes early in the year and then they come out later in the year uh, i certainly or the biology teacher certainly bring our classes out here uh, to use this area um, yeah this is a perfect example of the evidence because a lot of times when you have 35 students walking out here you're not going to see wildlife you've mm -hmm. scared them away mm -hmm. so we come out here and we look for evidence of wildlife so we see the the bones the tracks the scat right. and whatnot so um, yeah this gets used frequently uh, and we love it so my advice to some of you who are doing perhaps just even a little garden is get the scouts involved they may may not be high schoolers that are uh, looking for their eagle scout project um, although you can look into that, but uh, the Boy Scouts, the, the troops out there, they'd love to come out and, and help. So, um. Just on a side note, I've made a little boutonniere out of uh, California pseudo-nephalium. Look that up. It's got a P that doesn't say anything and a G that doesn't say anything in its name. So good luck on the spelling. But I just want to say it's a banner year for this false pearly everlast, or whatever the common name is. Every common name is correct, I was told, by a famous botanist called Fred Sproul. So, and you can use that, Tony, in your classes. Every common name is correct. It, it really points to the idea that you need to learn the botanical names. But off in the hills, you see the white flowers of the pseudonephalium, and I've seen it all over the Southland, and I can't remember a year when this plant has been this successful, it's an annual or short-lived perennial, and I cannot remember a year when I've seen more pseudonephalium in bloom than this year. So just a little side note on 2020 and what we're seeing in the hills around us. Let's go to the other garden. Hey, thanks for sticking with us through this uh, workshop video on Tesoro High School's native plant garden. This is where it all started. We've got this wonderful, diverse garden, and Tony's gonna walk us through it, but I'd like to point out that Takati Cypress, which while it is not native right here, it's native on the mountain just behind us, on in the Saddleback, on uh, in a certain canyon back there, uh, Cole Canyon, or I can't remember the name, but it's one of the only places where Takati Cypress grows in the whole state. And then some other Southern California natives, like the Matillaha poppy, the Salvia munzai, which I'm just getting my aromatherapy from, the holly leaf cherry, Cleveland sage, and a few other suspects in here, which are uh, native close by 
So I think the point here is the beauty of California natives when they're grown in a naturalistic way and left to their own, they are local species. Do you ever water this? <laughs> no, at this point, no, never. So we're talking never. no summer water, rainfall only. After, after five years of uh, being planted, how about the weeds? Since you're not watering, you don't get summer weeds. What do you do about winter weeds? Well, um, taking care of the gardens for me is all about efficiency. Mm -hmm. um, like I said before, only so many hours in the day, so I have myself a weed whacker. A weed whacker. <laughs> okay. I bet you've gotten pretty good with it. Oh, yeah. Now, from time to time, we'll get the kids out uh -huh. and we'll pull weeds, you know, roots and all, mm -hmm. especially with the newer plants. Yes as their, their, uh, for their service hours, uh -huh. um, give them a little uh, TLC. Uh -huh. But uh, again, time and efficiency warrants the weed whacker. Okay, so walk us through. Can we walk through, Kev? And give us a little outline of what comes to mind as we see some of these plants and we see this lovely native plant garden. <laughs> and we, when we see these plants in this lovely native plant garden, give us a little what well, comes to your mind as we walk through? Let's what first ahead. comes to mind is what I'm looking at oh, behind okay. Kevin. That's what it used to look like. Okay, so I walk over here and you say before and after. <laughs> before. And after. <laughs> and no water. Right. Currently. Every now and then we'll supplement some open areas with the plant. Uh, when I make a trip down to Tree of Life and, and, and get uh, uh, plants every now and then, I'll siphon off a few and we'll, we'll stick them in some areas uh, that, uh, where there's some space for them. But uh, yeah, again, a whole host of scout projects here from uh, signs to this bridge to this uh, swale here, this little, little stream. We have a pond back in there. A pond. We do have a pond. It's it's dry most of the year because it just relies on the winter rain. Um, it's a bit of a vernal pool. Yes. Okay. And yes. what's this riparian feature behind us? Well, that was uh, this area was mitigated when the school was built. Okay. Uh, this creek uh, with these uh, cottonwoods and uh, willows and mule fat and whatnot. Is there standing water in or? gently flowing water in the bottom of this little draw all year or is it seasonal? It's seasonal as well. Okay, so right. we have a trail that extends on down that way which we call our riparian trail right. and, and it, we venture and on down there from plants, time to time. Which, yep. which add to the diversity of the wild. I just saw a native bee buzzing around looking for a place to lay some eggs I'm sure in the ground and what other kinds of wildlife and insects, hummingbirds, uh, pollinators, mammals? What do you all, see? Out all there? of the above. All reptiles. of the above. Reptiles. What kind uh, of lizards you certainly. got? Certainly. We haven't talked about it. It says right here a sign lizard habitat. Interestingly enough, my That's uh, well. For the English speaking lizards. My uh, two little ones. Uh, I've got four, uh, two in college, and then uh, one uh, soon to be in sixth grade, and one is going to be in eighth grade. But a few years back, they um, made this uh, lizard habitat Did here. Really? So. Uh, so thanks to the, the, the Tubbs kids, yeah. And it's got, you've got your family involved in this, too. All right. I think that sign's a little high. If it would have been lower, it'd be easier for the lizards to read without having to crane their necks. <laughs> funny, <laughs> funny story real quick. When we had the basketball team out here digging the holes, we had a young man that was uh, right here with a shovel in his hand or a rock bar or something, and one of his friends called out to him, and he turned around, hey, what? And he got a big old uh, sausage link from nice. the Choya cactus stuck in his. Uh, yeah. We we got it right out of there right. and sent him to the trainer. He was fine. So, right. so <laughs> everybody has to have one at least one encounter with a Choya. Okay, what else you got? <laughs> oh man, the the Matalia poppy. I know you pronounced it a little mm -hmm. differently. Matilla. Huh? Matilla. Mm -hmm. yeah, man. Every common name is correct. My mother's favorite flower uh -huh. yeah anytime we uh would go hiking uh she would comment on what she called the fried egg plant yeah that's another common name yeah is correct so this is a good stand of it so oh right, right down here um last year you know you couldn't ask for more we were out here actually it was earlier this year when we were studying ecology uh -huh. um we had a praying mantis 
right here, it was the coolest thing. There was a butterfly flittering around, landing on flowers when this was in bloom back in, I believe it was September. Mm -hmm. And it crawled up one of these stalks and the wind was blowing like this. It was crawling up, it was eyeing a butterfly that was landing on these flowers. Well, the butterfly landed on a flower that was on a, on a stem next to the praying mantis and the wind, and this was all over the period of like 10 minutes, the wind, and by that time we had, we started with a couple students here and I was talking to them and telling them, watch this, watch this. By the time it caught the butterfly, we had about 20 students around here that oh, saw this National gosh. Geographic moment, but the wind blew this plant next to the flower like that and the praying mantis went up and grabbed the butterfly and started oh yeah, my it gosh was, it was incredible did you get that on film i did not oh um, 20 people saw it yeah and, exactly and so that left an impression that they're going to remember the rest of their lives so that was pretty cool and it left a story that we're hearing right now which is awesome there's an oak coast live oak which will someday provide shade for this area right here manzanita behind manzanita you we've got a few out here which i've learned to just <laughs> let them go that's a Don't. peninsular manzanita yes okay so this is another rare species from san diego county and very appropriate for a garden like this especially from a teaching standpoint because you have several rare or threatened species represented here. There's a little rose over here, which is um, Baja rose? the Baja rose, but there is a stand in San Diego County right on the border, making that a rare plant. So you have features here. Great Basin Sagebrush. Great Basin Sagebrush, which is native right around here as well. What else we got over this way? A couple of black sage here doing really well. Black sage with lots of flowers this time of year. This is a pollinator magnet. Yeah, the toyon and the elderberry. Well, I'll repeat it. Doesn't get much better than this. This is a real treat for anybody who comes to visit. Do you also have people walk through that are just like local uh, Dog walkers, no dogs allowed on the campus, but it, I'm thinking resident neighbors or people that use the campus for exercise. Maybe they go around the track walking and then they find your garden. Oh, definitely. I advertise that this is open 24 seven. It's not behind a gate. That other one's behind a, a gate, mm -hmm. but this one's open. You can't come here during school hours, but certainly after school hours on the weekends. Mm -hmm. um, you park in our front parking lot by the gym tennis court area and you walk down the little uh, access road to Sorrel mm -hmm. Creek Road. Mm -hmm. And yeah, this is open for people to come uh, meander through the trail system here and down the, uh, the riparian trail down that way. So are there, are there more, red tail, are there more uh, plans for the uh, area downstream from us? Oh yeah, we have an area probably, it's probably at least the size of this area uh, that we're going to restore. There's a bush monkey flower we just walked past. Bush monkey flower, California Sticky mo yeah. San Diego sunflower. Now this, uh, you're, you're battling this old status, right? This, this exotic plant. Yes. Okay. Who knows where this came from? I'm Mike. guessing. Mike. Oh. Oh yeah. Sorry. Back on. Sorry about that. Who knows where this came from? I'm guessing um, some errant hydroseed mix on maybe at the time the school was built and maybe the seed was in the tank even though they intended it to be native uh, plant forensics how did that plant get here is a fun hobby but i noticed there's a huge stand of this non-native limonium status over there That's definitely where it came from. and it came from there and it, it you could have worse problems and i know you're taking care of this by eliminating it so just to point out if anybody saw that in the side of their eye as we walked by we all know this is not a native plant okay so tony or mr tubbs as you're called here on this campus at tesoro high school we want to thank you for showing us the tesoro nature trail and the California Native Plant Garden on Tesoro High School. 
And we're just going to finish up here by seeing uh, an area in transition. You saw the before and the after, and we still have more area here. So your plans are to uh, continue this native plant garden so that the before has an in-between and an after story for the next time we visit with you, right? Yeah, definitely. We're going to restore this whole hillside. Um, again, I looked at the map and I said, well, there's our boundary. We're going to make a difference in all the areas that are within our boundary. Okay, and this is all done with no permanent irrigation system, no uh, complicated maintenance schedule, just volunteer and dedication, passion, and common sense that these plants are native, and when you plant them right and take care of them right for their first six or seven months, they take care of themselves from then on. That's the great take home on the horticulture side. But the other side of this message is how you're impacting lives and wildlife. What's that box on the pole right there? That was another Eagle Scout project. That's a box for a Western screech owl. So this box is specific for a species of owl? Specifically designed for the western screech owl. We have a box behind us. I think it's obscured by the cottonwood there, but that one was built for a barn owl. Wow. Currently, okay. there are no nesting pairs in either one of those boxes, but uh, that's our hope. Okay, well, they just haven't read the sign yet. <laughs> they, they'll be here because we know you plan it and they will come, and it's about the habitat as well as the particular box which was built for the intent so you've got science you've got culture you've got community you've got horticulture and you're mostly you're having fun aren't you oh i'm having loads of fun <laughs> okay. Lo love it it's love not it. like you needed a project passion. you were, okay yeah tony was teacher of the year in 2015 which is no small deal and we can see why so this has just been another example of some of the best of california Okay, thank you all for watching and thank you Tony for uh, leading us on this awesome, awesome workshop and for all the work that you do. I think it's, uh, as we all saw, it's a fine example of bringing a community together for education, for, but also to connect the students and the adults and everybody together to connect with nature and uh, he did an exceptional job with it. Um, as you can see, it's a lot of work over time, and but it's a labor of love. It's something that seems very, very rewarding. Um, some of the examples that Tony led there of how he was able to uh, also learn how to install the plants, maintain the plants, uh, it, it, it doesn't get much better than how Tony did it there. So um, we here at Tree of Life are also a resource for you if you're looking to start a native plant garden. Uh, for education or whatever it may be uh, and uh, we'll help you with also the planting, plant selection and uh, maintenance or uh, care of those plants as well. Um, if you guys have never seen, uh, Tony's Instagram is probably one of the best nature photography sites I've ever seen and it is uh, mentioned a couple times here but uh, we can put it in the comments. I think Tony mentioned it but it's at Tubbs Tesoro and it's an incredible, incredible uh, uh, things to, to view it's all the wildlife that's happening around uh, the garden there. Uh, we want to do more workshops like this out in the field. So we may be visiting other gardens, other uh, restoration sites, or uh, just plant communities in general. But uh, let us know what you would like to see um, down in the comment section as well. 
Um, but yeah, so the nursery is still open. Uh, we are open Monday through Saturday, 9 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. That's our current hours. Uh, we are closed Sundays. Uh, but that, like I said, that's our current hours. Uh, it's fluctuated and changed a little bit over these times, so always call ahead if you would like. But stay tuned to our social media. We usually post about that, as well as on our website. Um, we also uh, expanded the retail section to include what we call La Finca, or the farm. And we are now growing vegetable starts. And the, so you can bring plants of... of of, of different summer vegetables. We'll do some winter vegetables as well in the cool season, but these are excellent companion plants with the native plants to bring in pollinators, beneficials as well to have a very productive uh, and bountiful garden at your own home. Um, we also are having a you pick with our partners at South Coast Farms. Uh, Farmer George has grown an incredible, incredible crop of strawberries right now all nice and fresh and organically grown and so you are able to come down and pick these strawberries yourself uh, it is a separate operation so uh, you will be paying and everything through uh, south coast farms but it is located here at the nursery you will see signs as you come in to get you all the way out to the field and get you to start picking some strawberries uh, we ask that you just drive very very slow through the nursery and just for everyone's safety um, but that's what we got today guys we really appreciate everyone joining us uh, let us know how you how you liked it uh, and share this with your friends uh, we're trying to build this YouTube channel to bring more and more workshops like this to you guys and make it available so please subscribe we have a uh, uh, we have a 1,000 subscriber goal we're trying to reach and uh, by subscribing you are actually throwing your name in a hat to win one of those Matilla Ha poppies or fried egg plants that we saw today in uh, Tony's garden. So thank you all for watching and we will see you next week. I never know how to end.